All right, so uh, apologize for that pause, but welcome everybody. This is a um, webinar talking about supporting entrepreneurs and ventures in Washington County. And definitely want to thank the cities of uh, Forest Grove, Sherwood, Tigard, and Wilsonville for sponsoring this event. So I'm Laura Kubishek. For those that don't know me, I'm Laura Kubishek. I'm the Venture Catalyst for Washington County, and I have the pleasure of uh, having Anna Showed, who's a, both an entrepreneur and an investor. She's going to be joining me as well for this webinar. And Anna's going to share her feel, her uh, input in terms of not only the journey she had in terms of becoming a very successful entrepreneur and a successful exit, but also serving as an angel investor and a venture capitalist. So it's going to be great practical insights coming from Anna. But with that, let me get started. And uh, let me also say that if you do have questions, just put it in the chat room. I'll take a look at, at, uh, at those when I turn it over to Anna. So, um, but we definitely want this to be an interactive session. So yes, please make sure that, um, that you do that. And I just wanna check one last thing. Okay, here we go. All right, so. What I'm going to talk about is um, entrepreneurship as an economic driver. For those economic development people that are on this webinar, I certainly want to put a, a pitch in here for entrepreneurship in general. So I'll talk about that. Then I'll give an overview of the Venture Catalyst Network and talk about what we do across the state of Oregon. Then I'll focus specifically on Washington County and talk about the services that I provide entrepreneurs in Washington County. I'm also going to give a little primer on equity financing. There's a broad range when it comes to equity financing and I want to make sure people are one familiar with the vocabulary and two familiar with the resources that are available for you. So with that we'll go ahead and get started. So entrepreneurship. It's important for everyone to understand that entrepreneurship is an economic driver as well as a community driver. Uh, there's been lots of studies by Kauffman Foundation and others that say entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and startups, they create a significant share of jobs across the country. And the great thing about entrepreneurship is very culturally diverse. No matter what your background, people are intentionally going in and starting new businesses. The other interesting data point is that entrepreneurs are very age agnostic. And I can say that, you know, back in the day, pre-COVID, when I was having pub talks at the Golden Valley right off of, uh, of uh, Highway 26, that there were people there ranging from age 25 to 65. And the fabulous thing about that is People were very much engaged in the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem, and there was a lot of uh, sharing of information back and forth, and it really helps build out a great ecosystem and a great community. And of course, entrepreneurs who are building businesses, creating revenue and creating jobs are also helping build wealth within the local community. So let me talk now about the Venture Catalyst Network. So the Venture Catalyst, if you don't know our backgrounds, um, the Venture Catalysts are either successful entrepreneurs or successful business people who are now giving back to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And what we do is we partner with regional economic development organizations throughout the state of Oregon. And our main goal is just giving um, these startups a leg up. So we'll coach and mentor. Our main focus is scalable traded sector companies, but we also have rural venture catalysts that are focusing more on, on Main Street or, or certainly help out Main Street companies as well. So in addition to coaching and mentoring, we're also connectors. So we will connect the entrepreneurs to the right people, who could be mentors or people that have experience in a particular industry. 
programs, educational programs or other types of programs, as well as capital, and that could be debt or equity to fuel their success. And the cool thing about us being a, um, a network across the state of Oregon is that we can take our regional ecosystem and connect it into the statewide ecosystem. So there might be, say, someone in Bend or someone in, in Southern Oregon who has expertise in the particular business you're trying to start up. By nature that we are a statewide network, we can help provide those connections. And I think it's also very important to state that another goal that we have as Venture Catalysts is we really want to enhance the resource access to everyone. So we clearly support diversity and inclusivity. And no matter your background, we wanna make sure you have the same opportunities as anyone else across the state in terms of accessing resources. So one of the things that's helpful to, to talk about is just really how we fit into the ecosystem. So I think a lot of you are probably familiar with um, the SBDC or your local chamber of commerce. These are general statements, but those groups tend to focus on um, small businesses, more main street or even regionally focused service organizations. And then we have the, um, the economic development people, and that could be city, county, or regional economic development organizations, or even like business or trade organizations. They tend to focus more on keeping businesses in the, in the region, so business retention, expanding those businesses, as well as recruiting more businesses into the region. And where the venture catalyst fit is in this, this section here, in the top left quadrant. So we really focus on scalable traded sector startups and help fill that gap that maybe some of these other organizations don't have a chance to fill. But as you'll hear, as I continue to talk about um, the role of the Venture Catalyst, we partner with everybody that's on this slide. So within Washington County, the role of the Venture Catalyst is supported by these organizations, the City of Forest Grove, City of Hillsboro, Washington County, Virtulab, and for those of you that don't know Virtulab, they focus on clean tech um, companies, so those that are, are certainly environmentally conscious and doing things to address climate change. So Virtulab is also a sponsor of the Venture Catalyst, myself here in Washington County. Oregon Community Foundation, which is the state's largest foundation, is also a sponsor, as well as, as Thai Oregon. And the great thing is that because I am supported by these wonderful organizations, I'm able to offer these services for free to, to entrepreneurs. So before I talk about my services, I'd like to share a little bit of information about Thai Oregon and the Thai Oregon Foundation. They, they are the organization that I'm aligned with. They're all also, their office is located in Washington County. So they're, they're definitely a local resource and one that I definitely want to make sure that you're aware of. So, so Thai Oregon is a chapter of Thai Global, which is a global organization, as you can see, founded in 1992 in Silicon Valley. And it was by entrepreneurs coming from the, the country of India. And their mission was just to help foster entrepreneurship. And it started again in Silicon Valley, but now it's a global effort. And their mission is just helping entrepreneurs through funding, mentoring, networking, and education. So they clearly align with the mission and objectives of the Venture Catalyst. And also a critical part of their mission is inclusivity. So the cool thing about Thai Oregon is that they support entrepreneurs of all backgrounds in all industries, no matter the stage that you're at. So again, 
they very much align with what we try to do as venture catalysts. So um, no matter what industry you're in, we work with entrepreneurs in the food and beverage industry, consumer products, all the way to software and high tech. So we wanna make sure that we are supporting entrepreneurs across a very broad, broad range of industries. And Ty Organ also has built, has built some very successful programs specifically focus on underserved entrepreneurs and helping raise money to provide these underserved entrepreneurs with scholarships so they can attend some of the programs. And the other thing I like about Thai Oregon is that they really walk the talk when it comes to diversity. I, I just put up some statistics to demonstrate that. But Ty Oregon's board, 62% women, 54% are from diverse populations. And the foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so that's what I'm aligned with, their board is 67% women, 50% from diverse populations. And the staff, as you can see, is also very diverse as well. So it's a great organization to be aligned with. And I'll talk about that more as well as Anna. So in terms of specifically the services that I offer as a venture catalyst, they're basically in three different buckets. One is support of the startups. Second is um, running educational programs to pe teach people about different aspects of a business and bring together panels to share their expertise, as well as developing infrastructure if we see there's a gap. And I really welcome any advice from, from all of you that are on the call. If you see gaps where you're not being supported, please let me know because I'd like to address that with the entire ecosystem. So let's start by me talking about what I do to support startups. So first thing I do is meet one-on-one -on -one with an entrepreneur. And I talk to them about the, their business model, what kind of, kind of ventures are they trying to start, they have a business plan, well, I'll review that business plan or I will direct them to resources about how to build a business plan. So that's a great starting point as you're building out your company. We'll talk about strategy, not only strategy in terms of how you're gonna to go to market or how you're gonna make your product, but what's your strategy to get financing? So that's an important part in terms of growing your venture. I do a lot of pitch coaching. So when you are looking for money, typically, whether it's a bank or going to a venture capitalist or angel investor, you're gonna to have to pitch your venture and why, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? What's your solution and why it's better than anything else out there? So I will help you through that pitch coaching. And then I'll provide a warm introduction to people who might be able to provide you, you money. And as I mentioned too, Venture Catalysts, we're really strong connectors. So if you need particular expertise in a certain area, we've got a broad network, so we'll connect you with people. And as I mentioned, um, we'll also suggest programs. So I call out two that I really love. One is the Thai Excel Bootcamp. It's a great way, if you've never started a company and you're, you're looking for a process or steps that you need to take, to start your venture, going through the boot camp, it's an eight or 10 week program, but it is a great way to get all your ducks in a row so you have a strong value proposition at the end and you have a strong business plan to build out your venture. The other thing that the Thai organization does is they have this Mentor Connect program. So if you are looking for a mentor, you can sign in, join one of these Mentor Connect um, uh, webinars or, or uh, programs that are going on and talk about or let them know what sort of mentor that you're looking for and they'll do everything they can to connect you to the right person. So that is in direct support of, of startups. And again, feel free to put questions into the online chat and when I'm done, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a look at that because we want to make sure this is an interactive session and that you have a chance to get your questions answered. Okay, so in terms of educational programs, the other thing I do is put on workshops. So some of the workshops I've done in the past is on marketing, different aspects of marketing from market research to customer validation to building a value proposition. I also this summer held a workshop leading in uncertain times, 
certainly going through this whole pandemic has been challenging for everyone. And just giving, you know, hearing an, a, a webinar with some pointers about how you lead in uncertain times. And sometimes it's just not the pandemic. Sometimes there's other economic uncertainties going on or uncertain times in your life. It's just good just to be a reminder of, of how you can bring some sanity back in your own life, but also make sure that you're well prepared in terms of running your business. The other thing I mentioned is I do a lot of pitch coaching. I also do a workshop on um, you know, preparing your investor pitch deck. Again, I did that this summer. I'm happy to do it, do it again this spring. I basically talk about all the elements you're going to need in a pitch deck in order to be more effective as you talk with potential investors. And then the last thing I mentioned is talking about these pub talks I, I put on or, or panel discussions. And these are some, again, that I, I put on fairly recently. One about raising capital, whether it's equity or debt. Uh, building teams, that's one of the challenges of a startup. How do you actually attract people and, and build out a team? So we had a panel of entrepreneurs talking about how they went about building their own teams. And then I had another panel that I would say was, all, was very emotional and inspirational, and it was about learning from failure. And I think you always hear about the great success stories of these startups and their wonderful exits, and now they're millionaires. It's interesting to hear how they started and how they had to you know, bootstrap their venture with little funds and the sacrifices that they made in order to build an important, a, 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 a very successful company. And I think it's, it was an important reminder, being an entrepreneur is not for the faint of heart. It's a tough but rewarding um, opportunity that, that you can build, not only for yourself, but your employees. And making sure you got the resiliency and the perseverance to drive drive through So anyways, that was a very inspiring um, panel discussion that we had recently. And the last thing I talked about or, or that I focus on is developing infrastructure. And I talked about filling gaps. So one thing I wanna make sure is that within Washington County, we are building an ecosystem and a community here in Washington County that is very appealing and attracting for people to start their businesses. So I work with um, partner organizations as well as city and county government to help build that kind of culture. And the other thing I'm, I'm working on is building local entrepreneurs that are in our backyard that can reach out to many of you as entrepreneurs and startups and, and you know, help you through some of these processes. And the other thing I, I do, and that's why I love so much engaging with all of you who are entrepreneurs and starting new businesses or have existing businesses and you tell me about your challenges is I look for what sort of gaps we might have here in Washington County. And, and, and these are just examples. I'm not saying they are gaps in Washington County because we actually do have an incubator here, OTBC. We have, uh, and there's venture funds. But I also look to see, do we need more maker spaces or lab space? Do we need pitch competitions to you know, build excitement about what we're doing here in Washington County for entrepreneurship? Do we need to focus on specific clusters of industries because that's very popular here in Washington County? So, so those are the things that I would love to hear more about from all of you that, that are on this, on this webinar. Okay, in terms of the um, resources, definitely I work with partner organizations to help people through all stages of an entrepreneur's growth. And I've talked with over 40 partners right now, and all of these people are bringing resources here to Washington County. So here's, here's just a list, and you all are familiar with, you know, the SBDC, OTBC I mentioned as an incubator, you can get uh, capital from Portland Seed Fund, Craft3, TAOs focus on technology, Otradis focus on biotech, Thai Oregon I mentioned, um, MISO also provides um, alternative financing. 
via loans and mentorship. And Adelante Mujeres, they do a great job when it comes to the food and beverage industry. So these are all great resources here in Washington County. And what I want to make sure I share with all of you is that, um, that there are amazing resources here to support you as an entrepreneur. So no matter if we're talking about education and support, and I've already talked to you about, about some of the work I do in conjunction with uh, Ty Organ as well. I've worked very closely with OEN in the past, as well as TAO, Mercy Corps, Alante Mujeres, SBDC. So I cannot do my job as a venture catalyst without working with these, these partners. And whether it's incubators and accelerators, again, I mentioned OTBC, Otradi and OBI for bi biotech, Virtulab for clean tech, um, equity financing, and I'm going to talk about that, so I'm not going to go in a lot of detail about these folks because I'm going to talk about them in just a little bit, as well as debt financing. And I believe uh, MISO is going to, to have a, a, a session talking about the services they offer in debt financing, so I won't, I won't go into, into that right now, but Craft3, MISO, SBA also Business Oregon, for that matter, they all um, have great alternative financing for you. And even co-working spaces if you need a spot. So again, I just wanna make sure you're aware that there's a broad ecosystem to support you, but it's also confusing. You see all these logos here and it's like, oh, where, okay, like which one do I go to, Laura? So I will help be that point person there in the center. I'll learn more about your business and then I'll direct you to the right resources to help you be successful. So equity financing. So I'm gonna go through this um, fairly quickly. And um, again, make sure you put some questions here uh, in, the, in the chat room. And, but let me go ahead and get started. First, I wanna talk about what is equity financing. If you're not familiar with that, I wanna make sure we're all on the same same level in terms of understanding equity financing. And then I think it's, it's also very important that you understand the funding ladder in terms of how startups get funding in the various uh, stages that they go through. Then I'll talk about the types of equity inve investors. And then I'll also share a list of local venture funds so that you'll, have so, you'll know of some resources to potentially go to. So equity financing, what is that? So equity financing typically is used by entrepreneurs, by startups who aren't able to go to say a bank and secure a traditional loan because either they lack collateral, they might have insufficient cash flow, or they have more of a high risk profile. I mean, software entrepreneurs are classic, classic case where they have no collateral and they're starting a business they need some, some capital in terms of maybe their go-to-market plan, et cetera, but they aren't able to get a traditional loan. So those are the people that use equity financing. The people that uh, invest in equity are, are folks that are providing money, so capital, to grow your business in exchange for an ownership stake in the company. And so that's, I, I wanna emphasize that, that's the difference between a loan where they provide you money, right? And then you pay it back with interest. Equity investors provide you money, but in return, they, they would like some small ownership stake in your company. And there's a variety of types of equity investors. I am not going to talk about crowdfunding or strategic partners who, that's a great way to potentially raise capital. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about that, but for those of you that are entrepreneurs that do have strategic partners, that might be a great route as opposed to going to, you know, angels or venture capital, especially in the early days. So food for thought there. But what I do wanna talk about are angel investors, angel groups, and there's uh, many here, as well as venture capital firms. 
And I think you've heard, you know, equity investments typically are more risky, so they require high returns. So if you get out a loan, maybe it's 3%, 8%, 10% is your interest rate. Typically, when it comes to equity investments, people look, are looking for a 2x or 3x or 10x return, again, depending on how much capital they're providing you, the stage you're at, how risky your business is. So, so it's really a different profile than getting a loan. Okay, the funding ladder. It's really critical that you understand this because people come to me and they go, Laura, I'm starting a business. I need to go get a bunch of money. Well, you know, it typically doesn't work that way. First you start, you have an idea. So you have a concept stage. Usually you as the entrepreneur have to provide the money for that concept and building out your, your business plans. So that's what we're talking about. Bootstrapping is you provide your money and then you need to go out there and validate it. So maybe you develop a prototype, you go to some friends and family, you ask for money. You might be able to get a grant to get some initial money to help at least validate that customers indeed are interested in your product. And then it's time to start building it out. So you might go to crowdfunding or angel funds, as well as those venture capitalists that provide seed funds. And then as you get ready to launch, you're gonna need higher amounts of money. So typically angel funds, or again, going to venture capitalists, are the way to get that, that larger sum of money. And then once you're into the growth, again, venture capital really is, is the source. And then potential exits, I think nowadays, it's more common, more common to be acquired. So you sell your company as to actually do an IPO. And the red down here is just to indicate, you know, in the early days, you're actually going to invest money into your business before you start generating a profit. And it takes time. So just be aware that, that this is just the natural course of events. And as you launch then, and, and again, continue to build more customer interest in, in your product, then you're going to start building out that profitability. So in terms of the investing stages, um, you know, I talk about this a bit in the funding ladder, but people often ask me just in terms of the dollar amount. So I thought, again, just that you have this as a resource, and these are just typical numbers. So it's not set in stone, but just to give you an idea, when we talk about pre-seed, when you hear that terminology, pre-seed money, it's typically anywhere from 10,000 to $250,000. That's typically either coming from the own funds that you've saved up, friends and family, angels. Some people do go to crowdfunding as well. And that money's used to, create the product and start getting some market traction. Seed stage is, um, you know, again, roughly $250,000 to a million. And <clears throat> typically that's from early stage venture capital funds, either angel or angel groups will provide that, that amount of capital. And so that's used to accelerate the traction that you're getting in the marketplace. You're gonna to have to start building out a team and make sure you're solidifying it through patents or other means, your unique value proposition. And then you might hear the term series A, series B financing. That's really talking about venture capital firms that's typically raising over $2 million. And at that point, you're in that commercialization, that growth phase. So you're going into new markets, you're developing new products and really optimizing your business for fast growth. Okay, so angel investors. Let me, um, uh, you know, start by saying, these aren't people that are just floating out here in the stratosphere waiting to give people money. Angel investors, yes, they're high net worth individuals, but they're looking for a return just like any investor. So they'll provide money to a startup. They'll step up and give you that initial money. It's typically, again, this is terminology I want you to know about, a convertible note. So your company isn't valued yet. So it's actually a debt instrument. 
there's a there's an interest rate applied to that if you pay that back but they're not looking for you to pay back that loan so to speak they want that loan to turn into equity typically within 18 to to 24 months and they'll hold on to that equity you know typically less than 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 10 years and they want it then they want to see the return on the money angel groups are just a group of angel investors so the cool thing about the angel groups is they get together as a team in essence to do the due diligence to to you know learn more about the company the markets you know what's the demand and so they'll invest as a group and for the the benefit to investing as a group to the angel investor is you typically get more deals so you have more companies coming through that they can look at to potentially invest some angel groups will focus on a geography like pacific northwest a particular industry like food and beverage or even a, a, a demographic, um, you know, it might be women, veterans, something like that. They typically invest in seed to series A, A funding that I've already talked about. And then there's venture capital firms. So these are professionally managed. They could be public or private firms. They basically are managing anywhere from 10 million to over a billion dollars in terms of money. And that money comes from a variety of people. It comes from people that, that have you know, acquired wealth, either from their own exits or some other means. Sometimes it's uh, municipalities or states that want to invest money to see high growth in that kind of capital. Um, and so they're providing that money to companies, definitely for exchange, for uh, private equity or preferred stock. They're looking for companies that are in that growth phase, to, so beyond commercializing their idea. And they normally don't fund startups. You know, there's always exclusions, but they normally don't fund startups. You typically have to go after more angels or angel groups. Okay, so I wanted to share a, a couple of uh, funds in the area, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Anna here in just a second. So in terms of seed funds, I really want everyone to know about the Elevate Capital Inclusive Fund. So this is a great fund that's fo focused specifically on women, minorities, and veterans. And it's primarily in the Portland metro region. It's traditionally for people that haven't had access to venture capital, so it's certainly they're helping provide that seed money for them to start their business. Cascade Seed Fund Founders Pad are, are located in the Bend area. They're focused on typically Oregon, Pacific, Northwest. I think Founders Pad might go down into California. Um, Portland Seed Fund, you probably have heard of them. They are focused also on Oregon and Pacific Northwest. And then this is a new fund that you might not be aware of. It's the Rogue Women's Fund. They're focused, you know, early stage women-led companies, and that's a national. They're focused across the U United States. And then for later stage funds, again, Elevate Capital, they like to invest in Oregon companies, but they will also invest nationally and internationally. They are part of the, um, they, a lot of the folks there are part of Thai Global, so they get access to a lot of global, global startups as well. Oregon Venture Fund, that's based in Portland. Um, they focus on Oregon Pacific Northwest companies. Rogue Venture Partners also is in the greater Portland area. They tend to focus on tech, so whether it's business to business tech or consumer products tech in the Pacific Northwest, but throughout the United States. Seven Peaks at a Bend, also focus on tech, more software in Oregon, Pacific Northwest. Voyager, um, Oregon and Pacific Northwest, they're, they're based out of Seattle, but we've got a great representative here in the Portland area. And there's also a, a group called the Women's Venture Fund. They, they focus on diverse leadership teams, so not just women-led, but a diverse team, again, across the, the United States. And with that, 
Um, let me let me turn this over to Anna, but let me have the pleasure of introducing Anna first. So, Anna is the executive uh, an executive partner at Elevate Capital. She's a Thai Oregon board member as well as a, a Thai angel. She started her career as a financial business manager in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then. In early 2014, she co-founded Garden Bar, and I know many of you have been to this um, great place. It's the first fast, casual salad concept restaurant in the Northwest, so it's a great way to go get a, a healthy meal when you're on the run. And the impressive thing is that Anna grew Garden Bar you know, around 600% in revenue and expanded from nine to 120 employees in just five years. So an impressive track record. And then in 2019, Garden Bar was acquired by Evergreens. So Anna, in just a minute here, is gonna be able to provide you the full circle experience as an entrepreneur from the concept that she had of Garden Bar all the way to the exit with Evergreens. Again, she joined um, the board at Thai Oregon and invest in new, ve new ventures, not only personally as an angel, but then professionally in terms of part of Elevate Capital. And so these are the, the uh, topics that Anna is going to um, focus on her journey as an entrepreneur, which is a great journey to hear. To hear. She'll talk about her experience as a Thai angel investor, maybe share some surprising stories that she had. She'll also talk about her role as Elevate Capital, because again, that's a professionally managed venture capital firm. So it's important you, you understand that. And then she's gonna talk about expectations for those of you out there that are entrepreneurs that might be planning to go to either an angel or venture capital firm, and she's gonna give you a heads up in terms of what those investors are gonna be looking for from you as, as an entrepreneur. And with that, I will stop my screen sharing. Sorry. Let me put my glasses on. Uh, stop share. Here we go. <laughs> oh, I like that better. Uh, I get yeah, yeah. So it, thanks everybody. everybody for your patience as I <laughs> as I'm managing as well as being presenter. But it is such a pleasure to have Anna here on the call. And Anna, I will turn it over to you to at least to start um by sharing your journey so welcome You're so sweet thank you for the nice intro yeah and i want to say that i'm gonna try my best not to talk a lot and then try to open up for questions later because i think there's a lot of confusion in the terminology and everything else and and i do want to say i am also on the board of miso so if you guys have any questions on what the difference between all of these let me know i i, I covered the full gamut of uh of money and fundraising but um but yeah so laura explained i i did start a company from concept to exit i've been in every single seat that anyone can be in the entrepreneur journey i know the crazy world of entrepreneurship um but then also what it did is it gave me the full range of experience from you know what she explained earlier with the funding ladder i did every single one of them except for ipo i didn't do the <laughs> that didn't happen but i did um you know i had my 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 self-funding the bootstrapping fans and family equity convertible note and then conventional loan which was hard which is why misa came into the plan um and all and then understanding the, the what to do with the investors doing their journey and then uh, figuring out the way to to exit and then getting through the exit piece uh for, with our our evergreen competitors so just so you know uh, yes yeah, so to just to confirm what laura said 
I had this chain of restaurants that we grew, I grew it from zero to nine stores. And when I was building the 10th store, I started talking about, you know, what would be the next step for the company. And that's when the acquisition became a possibility and then we ended up getting acquired. So that experience was uh, phenomenal, needless to say. It was hard, but it was so phenomenal. And what it did is it gave me this exposure to what it is to, to be, um, you know, basically everything that Laura explained that the services are is what every entrepreneur needs all along. But a lot of us don't even know that those services exist to begin with. So sometimes we're just like, you know, pulling our hair out, not knowing that there is support. Um, so I, I, I would say that I learned the, the hard way. And, and like Laura now, I have this idea where I want to help other people not having to go through the same drama uh, and all the hardship that it happens. And it happens from when you're starting, you know, learning how you're going to, you know, fund that business and the pitch place and talking to investors and all that. When I got acquired, so I developed a really good relationship with my investors and obviously full disclosure, Ty was one, um, I definitely pitched to Ty Oregon and I had investors from Ty, Elevate Inclusive Capital was an investor. Um, I had obviously Misa. So what happened is when I ended up, when I sold the company, I had this great relationship and wanting to be on the other side and, and helping the people that, that I know is going through the same thing. So I ended up joining these boards with the intention of how can I, now, now I understand from now, and now I'm going to jump in topic number two, because Laura asked me, oh, any surprising stories? <laughs> yeah, surprising. <laughs> Not really surprising, but it was interesting because now being on the other side, watching people Pitch, watching companies pitch um, and being in due diligence teams and understanding what is that investors are looking for made just a huge world of difference. And I wish I knew that when I was pitching, right? So now when I help companies pitch, when I help CEOs, I have that in mind only because I feel like that's we 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 fall entrepreneurs fall in love with their ideas their ideas and a lot of times they think that whatever they see because they they just leave and breathe the idea and they know it so well and we make this mistake to think that everyone else out there sees what we see and they're not necessarily true because we know that so well but unless we know how to articulate and know how to develop that idea the investors won't be able to see it and understand the way we do. So uh, being on the other side, being in, sitting with Elevate, sitting with Ty, I now understand the difference of obviously too between angels and, be, and, and uh, venture capital, which as, as Laura explained really well, a venture capital, as you all know, and they pull money from different sources and then they make the decision on how they are going to disperse this money and invest. Where an angel group, uh, they are all presented with the options what are available to invest and then each angel will individually make that decision if that's right for them based on what they do or not. So individuals, the angels, indivi uh, they invest individually where the venture capital is a pool that gets invested. Now, what most people sometimes don't understand is that um, when a venture capital fund is created, there is a, what do we call it, Laura? I think it's got a prospectus or something. There's a document where the venture capital is going to give an idea to the investors where their money is going to go. So if the venture capital is, is one focused on impact, so let's say Elevate Inclusive, it's focused on women minority and, and veterans. Uh, so the money has to be dispersed that way. So when an investor chooses to join that fund, they know that someone is going to make the decision on what to invest. So think about that as a mutual fund. When you put the money and you trust the money manager where they are going to do that, it's a similar idea. Uh, but you need to know that if you're putting a mutual fund for gold, it's totally different than a mutual fund for tech companies, right? So you kind of know how you choose your investor group or, or that. So 
for the entrepreneurs, which is very important, is to know that when you go to pitch to a venture capital, just be knowledge or try to know that they invest in companies like yours. Sometimes it's nothing to do with you and your idea. It just has to be that that's not the right firm for you. I was in restaurants. You know how many people like to invest in restaurants? Zero. Everywhere. No one wants to do it. I had to push my way through. I actually, the first time I invested, I pitched a Thai they told me they would not invest in non-tech companies. And then I just kept asking, you know, until they finally broke down. So persistence, very important. Uh, also persistence and performance, right? I was able to show them that I had performed, that I had grown the company the way I did it. And then they started to develop some sort of a trust. But uh, very important to know that you are pitching to your audience. I think this is really key. Um, I'm not saying that you cannot get people from outside your audience. You probably could, but I, it's important for your own uh, knowledge that a lot of times if you're pitching outside your audience and you receive a no, that does not mean that your company is not good enough or that your idea is not good enough. It may mean that you're not a match. And that's a very important thing to think about when you're trying to raise money. Now, I'm going all over the place as things come up because there's so much to talk about in this product and I love talking about it. Um, I don't know how many people in this, in this webinar is actual entrepreneurs and if you are seeking funding or not. I think it's very important to understand if there is even a need and what kind of need it is and what to seek. You know, unfortunately, Shark Tank ruined it for everybody because everybody feels like I need to go in and get investor and that's how it validates my life. You know, I, you know, and everybody feels like oh, Shark Tank, Shark Tank. So here's the problem with Shark Tank is that it gives you this, this uh, false understanding that you need to get outside funding to be successful or unless an investor invests in you, you know, you're not good enough and it's nothing further from the truth. It is very important to understand the responsibility that comes when you take money from somebody else. And it's also very important to understand that, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, just because you understand your idea and you know exactly where you wanna go and you know this is the best thing ever, the investor may not see it and you have to find a way to articulate that vision in the way that it's achievable so the investor can be on board with you. And then you can actually, you know, you can actually uh, implement whatever it is. Because when you ask for money, it is the only thing that's really fair for the investor to know is what are you gonna do with this money? So, so what, how is the money that you were, that, that, that they're giving you, what is that gonna translate into? Is that gonna translate? So for example, I usually give my example, it's easy to understand. If I had you know, two stores and I knew I wanted to get to five and I was raising money for that, I would say I am raising this amount of money and this amount of money is going to get me to store number five. It's going to fund a new truck. It's going to fund new equipment. So the, the investors knew that the money that I got had a purpose. And then one thing that I gave them is I gave them this idea of what is the, how is the value of my company is going to increase from the money that I'm getting. So imagine now I have two stores and my company is worth, I don't know, I'm just going to throw this out there. I have just two, two locations and my company is worth 1.5 million, right? Now I build to location number five or six now the company is worth four. So now I can say, hey, I raised this amount of money. Let's pretend it was 500,000. And I went from 1.5 to four. So look at the return that this 500 is going to bring. So it's important to take your potential investor into this journey on how you think that the money that they're giving you is going to improve and increase the value of your company. So that's one important thing to very, be very cautious when you're asking for money. So number one is, do you need money? Let's, let's start with that, right? And you can have, like, again, Laura has these, all these services, and she mentioned, you know, um, when you have the startup support, 
that you have the business strategy piece that she's working with you. And basically, okay, what are we trying to do? Do we need money? And then once you make a determination, then you're gonna figure it out. What kind of money do I wanna bring in? Is this gonna be an equity play? Is this gonna be a debt instrument? Is it gonna be a convertible note? I, for instance, didn't know any of that. I did everything by trial and error. I am not gonna lie, this is, uh, I did not have, I did not have, I had to learn everything in my hand. I, I had ideas of, I knew how to start a company and manage a company. I had no idea the fundraising world was. So if I had to look back, I did an equity raise before I did a, a convertible note. And if I had to do it all over again, I would have started with a convertible note and then the equity. Had I had Laura to talk to, she probably would have told me that. I didn't know. So I guess this is the point of the conversation is that take advantage of these resources because it, you can totally learn like I did. Was it fun? Absolutely not. Did I cry a lot? Oh yes, every day almost. But that is like, there are people out there right now that have gone through this and that are figuring out ways to help you understand what, what is the best way to do it. Do you need money? Yes or no. If we do need money, what's the best way to do it? And then once you figure it out, you know, what kind of avenue you want to go, then you find the people that is most appropriate for you to go and pitch. And then there is a fourth piece, which is nail that pitch. Nail that pitch. That's the one thing I'm going to say. If there's one thing that Oregon doesn't have a lot is money to invest. Let's just say this is not California. Okay. This is not California. This is, this is very limited amount of money. And you have a very limited pool of people who are able to, to invest. So what you want to do, do not waste that shot. That's all I'm going to say. Do not waste that shot. Once you sit in front of an investor, you need to be ready to go. Because what I see a lot with my clients is that sometimes they go in and they sit down and they kind of want to do like a test pitch in front of an investor. But the once you lost that opportunity, the investor was like, I already heard that story. That person doesn't know X, Y, and Z. doesn't matter. So my suggestion is, you know, go through this checklist. Make sure you're prepared. And then when you go present and do your pitch, you know all the answers, you know, because put yourself in the, well, you can't, but it's hard. Now I can put myself in the shoes of, of my investors. I, I wasn't able when I was asking for money. I was like, how can you not see this is the best idea? But, you know, then I realized and I understood the importance of being able to articulate the vision. Also understanding that when you are a startup, um, you as the founder or the CEO, other person pitching, you're the one they're believing, they're believing in, right? They believe in you. And your ability to carry through with, with the things that you're telling them what you're gonna do is very important. So I wanna say one thing. One bucket here is the asking for money, is the doing the strategy, is finding the right people who are going to be able to give you the money and delivering the pitch. And then, you get the money and you go celebrate, get champagne, all that kind of stuff. And then it's like, oh, now what? Now I have the money in the bank. How do I execute? Biggest issue ever. Number one reason funded companies run out of money is because they don't know how to do with it. They run out of money. Like they literally do. Like, so they get the money and then they feel like, oh, I'm rich now. And then they don't know how to use it. So that part, and I think that Laura has a second bucket on her thing because she's got the startup piece, and then there is a piece where you're trying to figure out how to actually make sure that you implement your plan. Very crucial because honestly, most of us, at least I wasn't born a CEO. I didn't know I wasn't born a CEO. And a lot of my clients, it's funny, I just had a client last week. And he's like, I'm not, I, he's been in business for 15 years and he doesn't think he's a CEO. And I said, no, you've been a CEO for 15 years, but he doesn't call himself a CEO yet. He's like, oh, I'm not a CEO. I said, no one is born a CEO. You learn, you learn how to do these things. You learn how to, and that more resources you have, the better off you are. So 
understanding that you have this whole bubble of work to raise money, but then you're going to have to always make sure that you know how to use it once you have it. Because that track record of being able how to utilize the money and being able to come through with the things that you're doing is what's going to let you go to that series A, B, C, Z, all the way through the IPO. And then, poof, then you have all the things great. So, um, so those are the things that I think are noticeable to do. I think that uh, I wanted, I, I know you asked me to talk a little bit more about being in the angel group and being in the venture capital group. I think what I would say on that is again, remembering that the people that are listening to you don't necessarily uh, know exactly what you're trying to convey. So make sure you really know how to articulate, make sure that you have a really good plan and then once they are with you, then they are part of your team. Now they are now your supporters. Now, I mean, for me in particular, I took every dollar very seriously and my investors are everything to me because I felt really honored that they trusted me with their money. And that honor is something that I carried all the way because had they not trusted me with that money, I couldn't have done what I did. So it's something that I always honored and I always wanted to make sure that they were with me during the journey. I kept them informed. I gave them reports. I showed them what we were doing. So um, I never took it for granted. So this is sort of a little bit, Laura, I think that would be fun if we have some questions because I know people have specific questions. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. So that's great. Um, some specific questions. I want to get your thoughts on something too, but... So one of the questions is beyond Portland Seed Fund, what other funds are focusing on angel seed financing? So we talked about Thai angels. Are you aware of other angel funds? You listed five, Laura. What? Your, your slide listed five. Yeah. And my follow-up question was, outside there seems to only be portland seed fund it seems the the seed funds locally in portland are more focused on women-led companies and minority-led companies in in your slide there were oh. two cascade and founders that mm -hmm. sound like they're not in the greater portland area they, no but they invest i mean they're not physically located in portland but they invest in portland companies so so thanks for, for yeah. asking that question because I should clarify that. Well, and, it, and it's more if, if there's only Portland Seed Fund in Portland that will invest in male founded enterprises. And, and again, I, it, I'm just basing it off that slide. Is there a, it seems there's a gap there. Uh, so so maybe that slide misrepresents the things because Thai Angels, Thai Angels certainly um, invests in male and women-led. I was just talking about the inclusive funds specifically, but Thai okay. Angels, Thai Angels um, invest with people across the board. Mm -hmm. So okay. appreciate that clarity because I want to make sure that people um, don't think that there's, the seed funds are just investing in women, women minority, or veteran-owned businesses. They really go across the board. Okay. Yeah, thank so, you. Yeah, it was, like I said, there were five listed. Yeah. It seemed like at least the ones in Portland, outside of Portland Sea Fund, so Thai Angels as well. Yeah. And yeah. the seed, again, I think that's the challenge. We're noticing that people are moving upstream, seed capitals, let's just say, harder to find. And, you know, you and I have had that conversation. Uh-huh. So. Okay. Good, good. All right. Capital is always going to be hard to find, though. I mean, that is unfortunate, but it's true. I mean, it's the hardest one to seed capital for sure. You know, because you have to prove your model, so it's it's not an easy thing to do for the yeah. seed world. Yeah. And then, Bill, mm -hmm. you had another question just about because we all agree we're not California. You know, um, here in Oregon, and there is money here, obviously, from Adidas, Nike, Tech. Intel. Actually, a lot of those people either 
Um, well, there's the sports angels. Actually, I didn't mention that, but there's the sports yeah. angels. So if you, if you do have a, you know, consumer, a sports consumer products related product, uh, the sports angels definitely entertain, entertain that. Um, so could you talk about your question, Bill, in terms of do you feel like in Portland or in Oregon, are we more risk averse or tell me, tell me what you meant by your question. Yeah, so having, you know, lived in Seattle for a long time and have watched, you know, sort of how things blew up up there with Amazon, um, you know, that was more in the 90s, but I was there before. It seems that our people plowing, you know, my, people who've been here and have made their living here, are they turning around and feeding the community back? Or is it more, because again, it's not California. I don't think we want to be California. There's a reason why we're in Oregon. Um, if we wanted to be in California, we'd go down there. Um, same thing for Seattle. Um, it, it just, it, it, it seems that there's, it, it's like anywhere. There, there's capital. It's, is it being put back into the community? And if not, like I said, it doesn't seem, Portland hasn't had a big tech, you know, company go public, you know, there's no Microsoft, there's no Amazon here. Intel belong, Intel's a California based company. Um, obviously Tektronix is, is done well, so I don't wanna, um, and there's a semi, there's another semiconductor, uh, but I'm not sure, I think they're out of North Carolina, not based here. So I'm just, I'm trying to understand why, and Anna, this was your comment is that, you know, there, there's not money here, you know, we're not California, but I, I guess as I observe, it seems there's money here. Is it just that it's not being put back into new enterprises? Is it, are people risk, you know, like I said, if, if you took a hundred people with a net worth of let's say 5 million or more, you know, and you asked them to put 50 grand into a pool, that's not going to hurt them in any, you know, I mean, that's like the that's pocket change, so to speak. You know, how, how do we, how do we create, more of this capital. I mean, and, and Laura, this, this gets to, you know, Josh and what he was trying to do with 1859 and hasn't been able to do is now taking a job up in the Seattle area. Yeah, so I have a couple things. Anna, were you gonna say something? No, you can say, I'll say. Okay, so, I mean, when I, 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 as you're talking, I'm thinking and, you know, there are, there's the Willamette Angels, you know, based out of Seattle, I mean, uh, Salem. Um, there's Angels down in uh, Roseburg, the, um, the Roseburg Angels. And I think, uh, you know, there, I think there's a group down in Southern Oregon as well. So I don't know them as much, but um, I should update my slide because now as we're talking, you know, there's other angel groups out there. So number one, I would say that. Number two, yes, there is wealth here, but you know, it's somewhat a function of population. Like, so mm -hmm. the population yeah. of Oregon, right? Yes. Smaller than the population of mm -hmm. Washington. So population of Portland, and I'm talking about greater Portland, but let's just, let's just keep it at Oregon. So I, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think the money, yes, there's money here. It's somewhat a function of population. Mm -hmm. And the last yeah. thing I would say was, I posted this event actually on Cal, Caligator. I don't know if y'all know that, but for those of you that do have um, tech products, it's a great um, aggregator calendar of events going on in the greater Portland area. And there was one and it was basically coffees angel investors were having coffee, virtual coffee together. So to me, that reinforced there's people out there, they're sharing ideas of what they're seeing in terms of deal flow and this and that. The challenge for all of us, and I would say the entrepreneurs as well as my role as Venture Catalyst, is seeking out those people, understanding what their thesis is, you know, what types of companies do they like to invest in, and then making sure that I help with the connections. But with that, I'll turn that over to Anna as well, because I think you had some comments. Well, I do, I agree with you. I mean, this has to do with density. Um, obviously, if you have a lot more startups happening in California, then the investors tend to go there a little more because of the deal flow. So it's like 
the chicken and the egg, you know, it's one of those things. But my point in that is that, yeah, there's people with money, there's no question. I mean, but it doesn't mean that the people with money want to be investors, right? You need to have appetite for risk. You can have a, you know, a Nike exec that has a lot of money. That Nike does, exec does not need to be an angel if he doesn't or she doesn't want to. So I'm not saying that there's no money. What I was saying was there is not a lot of money towards investing into startups in that. That's one thing. Another thing you said, Bill, that's very true, is Portland does not have a history of a lot of IPOs. I mean, I think we can count on five fingers maybe. So when investors are trying to put money in, um, you know, if they are looking for something that big, they are going to go where those potential companies are. Not to say that this is not going to happen. It's just a matter of how the chips are falling right now. So what my comment meant was this. Um, it's important for us to know where, where, the, where this, as a state we invest. So to give you an example, I have a client right now. His product is a uh, fantasy game for uh, Formula One. It's a sports, it's a sports betting app. And it is a, he has great potential. He has a sponsorship from F1 racers all over Europe, but he couldn't find anyone in Oregon to invest in him. And it's not because it's a bad idea. It's only because we don't have a segment that is focused on that particular industry that he is, right? So he had to seek money outside Oregon. Again, not because Oregon's bad or not because his company is bad. It's just that he did not have a match on what he's doing with what the investors are investing. So once we know that there is a match, like you just said, so for example, if I'm a, a woman minority, which when I was looking for money, I, I pitched to you know, uh, Elevate Inclusive because I was a match for them. So that was an easy way for me to, to pitch. So that's more into that scenario. It's more understanding that, I guess my comment was more towards, you know, uh, we don't have a lot of flow of money inv investing in startups. So the more prepared you can be to do a pitch, the more prepared you can be to know what you're doing with the money, the better and greater are the chances that you are going to be invested on. That's, that's my caution where, you know, the, the flip side is, you know, I lived in San Francisco for 20 years and it's a total different story. You can go unprepared to a pitch in, in Silicon Valley and then you, you, you mess it up, there is 20 other companies who can walk just in one street in Palo Alto yeah. and start going. So I don't know if you guys watched Silicon Valley show, but that is spot on when he goes from one to one to one. That's exactly what they did. That's exactly what people do there. So it's just not understanding what we have and making the best out of it so you can be successful. That's all I'm, I'm putting out there. Yeah, yeah. Two, two more quick oh. questions, if I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I was just going to add just to reinforce what, what Anna is saying. Um, also, because it is a little bit smaller community, everyone talks to each other. So I know for a fact, you know, that, that the investors for the Oregon Venture Fund are talking to Net and I and Anna and others in terms of Elevate Capital. So um, that just reinforces what Anna is saying. When you go to one, make sure you're re you're prepared because they all talk amongst each other. So, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. There one is more it, and then I've got another one coming up. So go ahead. Is there a database or a website of, you know, accredited investors in Oregon and what their interests are? Like, does anyone, has anyone published a website where you could, you know, either pay for the privilege or it's a free service that says, here are all the accredited investors who've shown interest in investing in early stage companies and here, you know, here's their interest, you know, what they would consider like the F1, maybe there isn't anyone, you know, focused on F1, but I'm just, that type of resource is something to consider so that we know what the pool is. We know what their interests are, you know, so that we don't, because, for me, I've, I've been raising this concept of the blue economy, and this is getting a lot of play elsewhere, not in Oregon. Um, I'm from the Northeast originally. It's getting some play there. It's getting some play down in California, uh, starting to up in Seattle. So I'm just, 
you know, these uh, finding people that fit your, and I, and I think that is the best point, finding people who fit your, you know, there's yeah. got to be a match. So, so how do we, you know, how do we I'll, facilitate? I'll so, so thanks for asking that question. I mean, I can certainly talk to some of the folks I know that are angels and see how they, how they feel. I think traditionally they like via word of mouth as opposed to actually, you know, publishing their interests. But, but, but let me test that idea. I, I think that's interesting because that's always a challenge, I think, for startups and entrepreneurs. It's like, where did, in fact, that was a pub talk. Uh, discussion once. Where do angels hide? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I was at that one. Right, right. We all would like to know that. So okay. Right, so right. But but do do it in a. I get it. So I, you know, the, a lot of them want to stay anonymous. Do it in a way that is anonymous. You know, like, hey, I'm investor number one. Here are my interests. You know, so uh -huh. that, that way. Yeah. You, you know, as long as you know what their interests are, you, you you're then, not. Yes, yes, yes. Without actually publishing their name and home address. So exactly. exactly. Appreciate that. Okay. They still like to hide. Yes. Yes. All right. So let me, let's see. Elad has a question. Is there a good proven way to get exposure to potential customers in Washington County for individual health providers? So Elad, are you still here? I was going to have yes, him. Yeah, yeah. So um, could you talk about what your question is and let's see if we can help. So I'm, I'm representing two businesses. One is mine uh, is a startup company. Uh, and the other is my wife's business. She's a nutritionist and a health coach. And uh, I've been uh, a little bit struggling of finding local uh, um, customers in this area while uh, most of our uh, customers are you know on the web and from other states and that's kind of surprising because she is very focused on plant based even vegan uh life lifestyle which is goes very well in in portland and is she just looking to try to uh talk to some local consumers get more customers for her business People who want to, you know, she's coaching uh, athletes and, and any type of, any per person that has a concern or, a, or an issue, even medical issue. She, she's been very successful with taking people off medication, helping people with uh, arthritis and some, you know, a lot of other inflammation uh, situation. Okay. Very successful. Well, maybe, but yeah. Yeah. So that. So maybe we can talk um, offline, or I'd be happy to um, talk to your wife as well. I might have some ideas there, or there's Would there's definitely that. groups and associations um, interested in in herbal medicine or healthy lifestyles and things like that that maybe you can tap into. So why don't you reach out to me? I have a slide here at the end. Um, with my email address and uh, reach out to me and we'll schedule some time. That would be beautiful. Okay. And, and my, my second question, question, yeah. Go ahead. This is regarding the company uh, which we're starting and we already have a product. We have a prototype that is working. We are uh, working on like a, a better version right now, second prototype. We also tried that specific product in, in some supermarkets, new seasons in Portland and other areas. Basically, um, I would say it's a smart end washing station that is completely independent. There's no, you don't have to connect it to anything and you just, you, you put your hands and there's a sequence that just cleans your hands with wa water and soap and so much better than you know the hand sanitizers right and you can roll it around you can put it anywhere um so we are there are some aspects of this that we want to get patented we just don't know who to talk to because we are self uh funded right now and we are pretty short on that mo that money needs to go into a second prototype you know so yeah so, I mean, so my, my recommendation, but then I'll, I'll bounce off on as well is, is definitely, um, 
to talk with a, a patent attorney. And um, so I was just trying to, I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking through, I'm not sure if there's a, a particular resource or someone that just to sort of bounce the I, I, idea off of, but I think um, really if you wanna seriously talk about it being patented, you gotta to pull together the money to talk to a patent attorney that that has experience, you know, in in all sorts of different areas. You know, potentially you might want to look for one that has experience in consumer products, um, given the way you you described it, and then see if you could just get a half hour hour of their time, and um, and get their get their feedback, and then you can decide if you really want to pursue it or not. But just just actually buying some of their time, even for a half hour, an hour, I think it'd be well worth it. But Anna, any thoughts on that as well? Uh, same thing, and I would say, similar to what I said before, make sure that you really, really need that patented because you think that that can be attractive to investors, but sometimes actually the opposite. Uh, investors okay. sometimes steer away from patented things, only not because they, sometimes it can be scary. Like the, the people who are, especially like, for example, um, some funds don't have people who specialize in patented things, so they are they can't really assess a company that has a patent, and they will automatically say, "We don't need you because there's a patent involved." What I would say is, you really find out if you need a patent first, you know, because you may not. You know, sometimes this is not this is not a drug or anything, and it, you know, and people can get around patent by changing one thing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you can have you can have this whole patent work done, and all of a sudden they change the the, the, the look of that and it doesn't infringe on your patent. So you've got to be careful on that too. So I agree with Laura, go yeah. talk to a patent attorney and then the patent attorney is going to give you this full picture of, you know, yeah, absolutely go for it because this can happen, this cannot happen. And then you can make a decision. And if you do go towards patent, I suggest that you, when you, if you go for fundraising, which looks like you might have to, that you find a fund that has somebody who, you know, handles a patent, people with patents, because not all of them do. And that's what you're going to Good point. On. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we kind of uh, between two routes right now, whether to go into market very fast or to delay everything, get a patent and then go to market. Yeah, so you need strategy. Yeah. So you need to hire Laura. That's strategy. All right. Strategy first. I, I, I come it. very reasonable. <laughs> I'm sure she That's does, a, but no matter what it is, it's funny that you save in the end. Trust me, it's like much, much needed. Getting your strategy together, I do not know that I can emphasize that more. It's huge, huge. So what? Maybe uh, one more short question, Go because ahead. you guys are representing uh, a lot of uh, municipalities. Uh, we feel like for my company product, there's going to be a, a very good match with uh, some departments of, you know, the cities, especially for outdoor events and anything that goes right now with COVID. Right. Um, you know, what would be like a good uh, mentor to have to the company that has the right connections to all these people? Yeah. I you, Laura? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I can help you with uh, some of the cities. One way to start is with the economic development person, and I know them in pretty much all the, all the local cities. So that's one way, one way to start. They'll likely point you to the person who's in charge of parts and rec, because mm -hmm. those are the people uh, managing those, those sorts of things, but you, if you want, and some of those people are on the call. But if you want to, um, yeah, I, th I think that's a good place to start and just get their feedback. Um, and, and now's okay. a good time to do it before, before the summertime. So, so great. So looks like we have a lot to talk about. Yes, I, I'm actually looking forward to that. I have additional questions. I'm not going to take the entire time. Okay. Did you have one more or is that it? Oh, I have plenty more. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, let me, but before, okay, because we're almost at the end of time here. Does anybody else have, have any questions? Yeah, so, um, 
So what, what, what am I doing a lot is, you know, definitely reach out to me. So what I was going to do was just share my screen one last time just to say thank you to everybody. And um, Anna and I really appreciate uh, all of you being on the, on the, whoops, the call with us. And um, I, again, here is my uh, email address, laura at venturecatalyst.biz. So if you'd like to set up a one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting with me, um, happy to do that. I'm doing that all via Zoom right now, but happy to, to meet with any and all of you on the call. And I, uh, again, thank, thank, the, thank the cities for being, for stepping up and providing this type of webinar to entrepreneurs and help build out the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem. That's uh, so important and I really appreciate your, your support. So with that. Thank I you everybody. Thanks yeah. for being on the call, I appreciate it. This thank one, you so thanks much. Laura. It's awesome. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you, Anna. I really appreciate uh, your participation and thank you to everybody here on the call. So uh, take care. I'm sure thank we'll see you again soon. All right. Bye bye. Thank you.